Hi everyone, welcome to the American Academy of Emergency Medicine, Women in Emergency Medicine Section's virtual mentoring session for osteopathic medical students. My name is Anantha Singaraj, I'm a fellow fourth year medical student and I will be moderating tonight's session. Tonight's program will be recorded and uploaded to AEM Women in EM's website within 24 hours. So if you miss part of this or if you have to leave early or know someone who would benefit from the session, feel free to let them know. This session is meant to be interactive, so please use the Q&A function if you'd like to ask a question or comment. We welcome and encourage your participation. We're a friendly group and look forward to getting to know each other better tonight. So I will go ahead and just kind of introduce our panelists right now. Um, first up, I'll introduce uh, Dr. Hillary Davenport. So she is the current clinical ultrasound fellow at The Ohio State University. She trained in emergency medicine and is staying on as faculty as an assistant professor of emergency medicine after she completes her fellowship in June of 2022. Uh, she did residency at the Uni University of Louisville in Kentucky. Uh, she initially did not match emergency medicine and scrambled into a tra transitional year um, position at Inspira Medical Center in Vinland, New Jersey. Uh, then proceeded to match at Hanuman University Hospital, Drex Drexel's College of Medicine's program. And unfortunately, after her first year there, the hospital closed and she had to transfer residencies to Louisville. Uh, her favorite hobbies outside of medicine are running, Orange Theory, drinking craft beer, and eating delicious food. She also has the most adorable orange cat and red golden retriever, who I hope will make an appearance today. Next is Dr. Karina Sanchez. She is core faculty of emergency medicine at Kern Medical in Bakersfield, California graduated from Ross University in 2015. She did not match and ended up in the SOAP. Thankfully, she landed a PGY1 prelim position uh, in surgery, which then helped her match into EM at the same hospital. She went on to complete an EM residency in Johnstown, Pennsylvania at Kahnemaw Memorial Medical Center. During her residency, she was elected to the EMRA Board of um, Resident Representatives Council uh, during her time on the board, she mentored students, residents, and was able to collaborate on a SOAP guide put out by CORD. She, since then, she moved on to become faculty, uh, finally moved on, home to her husband, who she'd been away from for eight years, and now has a baby girl. Since then, she's run for leadership positions with ASEP and serves as the Young Physician Section Alternate Counselor. Uh, next, we have Dr. Caitlin Bowers. Uh, she's an assistant professor of EM at Campbell University School of Osteopathic Medicine and works clinically in Rocky Mount, North Carolina. She did a residency at Doctors Hospital in Columbus, Ohio, where she met, served as chief resident. Throughout her training, she was actively involved with ACOEP and served as both student and resident chapter president. In her role at Campbell, she advises many of the EM students and have worked with students who have ended up in the SOAP over the past few years. Next, we have Dr. Daniel Mersch. Uh, he's currently the Assistant Professor of Emergency Medicine at the University of Buffalo. He's the Director of Undergraduate Ultrasound Education for the Medical School, the Director of Ultrasound Re Related Research, um, and also the Director for the Ultrasound Global Health Arm of the Division. He currently assists medical su students with learning point of care ultrasound um, in the emergency department and other avenues. And last but not least, we have Dr. Meg Jenkins-Turner, she is currently a general surgery PGY, PGY1 at UI Health in Chicago. She obtained the position outside the match after changing from internal medicine to surgery. She also obtained a categorical PGY2 general surgery position that she'll start July of this year, um, and which she also obtained outside the match. She's a big crime fiction reader and enjoys weightlifting. I personally know Meg, and I, although she's not in emergency medicine, I've watched her journey through this year, and I think she'd be a valued asset to this panel tonight. So panelists, welcome. The floor is now yours. Um, I guess just to start off with, SOAP is a very intimidating process. We hear about SOAP, we hear about scramble. We really don't know what's what. So if someone would like to kind of start us off, um, just kind of take us down that route. And again, uh, attendees, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat, in the Q&A, and I'll be sure to ask them in this next hour. I guess I can take that first intro to the SOAP. So you've heard of Scramble. That was 
before soap existed. So what would happen is you don't match on um, the announcement day of, hey, you matched and you get that sad letter that would say you didn't match. And then from there, all the open programs would just be accepting phone calls and you'd have to scramble to find programs by calling around and seeing who has an opening and who'd be willing to take you. So that doesn't exist anymore. Now it's the SOAP. Um, and that's basically just another five rounds of the match. You get, um, I don't know if you're going to go into the details or later, but you get um, 45 options uh, out of any programs that have openings that you don't have to pay for. Uh, that's included in your original payments. And then from there, you there's different strategies. Again, I don't know if we're going to go into this in detail later, but how to play those 45 but you, you do your further 45 applications or part of it and then part of it later. And then you go through five more rounds of the soap um, of the match process, the algorithm, and then it matches you up with programs based on that. So that's what the soap is and that's what the scramble was. So I hope that cleared that up. The soap is actually, I think a better scenario for most applicants because the scramble was really favored to people that had really good networking, in my opinion. Um, if you knew people who knew a lot of people in EM, they could backdoor you into programs and applicants that may have been much better than you um, never got the opportunity because spots, you know, happened so quick that someone knowing someone's phone number really helped them. So I think this is a much more even playing field of all the people who didn't match. It's just a very quick, rapid, stressful process, but it, it is better, I think. So I was someone that I had this really interesting experience of having to scramble. So I was one of like the last or next to last uh, classes of osteopathic students where the match was separate. So in the DO world, we scrambled, but then if you applied ACGME programs, then you had to SOAP. So when I found out it didn't match, I was just like, I didn't really know what to do really. So I will say that the scramble is it's you're literally scrambling and just calling all of these places and and you know Caitlin's right if you knew somebody that could backdoor you into x y and z then that was great but if not like it was like kind of like you're out of luck and it's kind of like interviewing for jobs like you'll get an offer and they're like okay well this offer is open until like 3 p.m. But if we get somebody else that accepts it sooner, then you're out of luck also. So I do believe that the soap does level the playing field, but it is like a mini match system over and over and over again. And sometimes you get lucky and then there are people that still don't get a spot out of the soap as well. Um, but I'm pretty sure like there's, there's definitely different strategies and stuff, but I think that you know, coming to this lecture and learning what those strategies are versus just going in blind is incredibly, will be inc incredibly helpful. I'm just going to share, I didn't get my position for the PGOI one spot until the last round of the soap. So it is like heartbreak after heartbreak after heartbreak of rejection letter. <laughs> you wait like till 3 p.m. and then it's a rejection letter. And then like it's meeting you when you're already letter. down. <laughs> yeah, it's horrible. Yeah. It's not yeah. And but then one said, thing that I, oh, yeah. Well, one thing that I was going to say is like, I know people that ended up taking categorical, we may go over this in some other part, but I know people that ended up taking categorical positions in like family medicine or, and they really wanted OBGYN or taking a categorical position in OBGYN when they really wanted surgery. And if you really don't match into a spot of something that you truly don't think that you're going to be happy in, taking that transitional year, whether it's in medicine or surgery, I think is, is a better idea because there's a whole bunch of stuff that goes around with your funding and trying to switch specialties that make things exponentially more complicated. Whereas if you sign a one-year contract and yeah, it sucks, you have to you know, do all your interviews again, apply through ARIS again, spend that money, try and figure out you know where you're 
going to take your time off while you're actually trying to doctor while everybody else is a fourth year medical student. But in the end, that worked out for me. I ended up in emergency medicine and I would not change that for anything in the world where where a girl that I know matched into family medicine and wanted to switch to OB and is still in family medicine. She's happy now, but that was not like her, her goal at the end of the day. And now it, and now she's doing, I believe an OB fellowship, but she still is not, did not go into initially what she had originally thought she wanted to. So that is just something to think about. I think we should bring up that whatever offer you get in the soap is a binding contract once you accept it. Um, so that's kind of what Hillary is touching on. And I think a lot of students aren't aware of all the funding that goes along with a categorical versus a transitional or prelim year position. And as an, from an advising standpoint, I've had a couple instances in the past couple of years where a student has got in their mind that they're going to switch specialties and this is going to be what it is and it's going to be fine. And then shortly after the SOAP, um, another program has suddenly gotten ACGME approval and has open spots for interns and they're, you know, they're in a binding contract and it really looks poorly to even try to get out of that, let alone if they don't let you out, it can be, you know, detrimental to you. So I think it is important to touch on all these funding issues. So you're aware of that when you try to make your strategy. I'm also someone who switched from a different specialty. And part of the reason I decided to do that is because I, kind of made it black and white. I thought either I'm not going to match internal medicine and um, have a chance at surgery. Um, and that's, you know, kind of what I went with. Cause at the time I was applying internal, I thought I, that I wanted to do medical oncology with rotation cancellations because of COVID my experience in both surgery and internal medicine was online. And so that kind of sent me back again, but um, just to reiterate what everyone else is saying, if you want to do something, I completely encourage you to go for that. And I'm in a current preliminary year that has since transitioned into categorical. So they're counting my prelim year. And, um, and so I just, I, I encourage all of you, if you want to do something and you have your, you know, kind of heart set on that, definitely think, think seriously about um, sticking, sticking to that if, um, you know, your passion continues to be there because it is possible to obtain a spot. Yeah. And I'm going to, oh, sorry, go ahead. Hillary. One more thing. And like when you are in panic mode of not matching, your mind is going to play like a bunch of tricks on you. You're going to think like, oh my God, I could be happy doing this. I could be happy doing this. I just want to like match somewhere. But just remember that those things are can be like fleeting moments of just you know you're upset you're kind of in shock so just you know kind of try and remember why you picked that specialty that you really wanted before you actually consider trying to maybe soap into a completely different specialty so I think that that's just something to be very cognizant of um because I know that even when I get mad or have any sort of emotions you know my mind will just like change like constantly so that's just something to be cognizant of yeah, I think one of the protective factors that you can really try and rely on in those first hours to days after you get that kind of news was uh, family and friends in your support network. So just make sure that you um, are with those people um, frequently and bouncing your ideas off of others and try not to go solo into a lot of these life-changing decisions. But at the same time, having a backup plan, I think is necessary. I don't think it's, you know, an option. Uh, when I didn't match into emergency medicine, um, you know, I was kind of reeling and going a lot of different directions. I was fortunate enough to be like, uh, I forget who said it, but the you're well connected, where you knew someone at a uh, traditional rotating internship year. So I contacted that person. Uh, she got me into her program. I did that year and did a bunch of extra ER um, rotations during that and was a, you know, very blessed to be able to get into the Drexel program uh, that Hillary was also uh, a part of. So when you are initially in that bad place uh, or that place of shock and awe and what am I gonna do, remember, a couple of things. One, you know, you have your family, you have your support network, you have those people who are there for you, and that's going to help to um, stabilize that situation. 
Secondly, understand that a backup plan is not the end of the world. I mean, uh, the, I think his name was Pete Best. He was the guy who was supposed to originally be the drummer for the Beatles and was and toured with them for a period of time until they kind of basically just kind of like left him at an airport and then picked up Ringo and that was the Beatles. So you actually talked to Pete Best many, many years down the line. He said, I, you know, it wasn't a good choice for me in the, in the you know, looking back, I'm so glad that my life turned out the way it did. You know, you can figure out how, what that means for you, um, but you can find happiness in a lot of different ways in medicine, caring for people. Um, so I was going to be going toward uh, family medicine, but, um, you know, God had a different direction for me in that way. I know we have a question, but I just want to hit rewind really quick. So um, what we're saying a lot of words, um, and I want to make sure that it's clear because I realize um, in my past mentoring while on the MRA board that a lot of people don't know what these things mean. So first and foremost, um, most people are familiar with MATCH and then they're gonna go into internal medicine or family medicine or in our case, EM, right? So that's a categorical spot. You've got your contract and it's gonna be for the whole residency. I mean, they'll have you sign it yearly, but you're basically contracting for the whole residency unless they fire you, let's not go there. So <laughs> that's number one. We've been saying this word prelim, as Hillary said, it's a one year contract. That's what that means. So there's two types of prelims. There's medicine prelim and there's surgery prelim. And all it is is a one year contract to do internal medicine or one year contract to do surgery. I used to joke that it was just like slave labor because they get you for one year, that they're, you know, that's it. So, but it's a great experience. Um, and as Hillary said, I, you know, I was thinking about, oh, Ross tells us do a family medicine. You can do fellowship afterwards. That's the safe bet. But I was like, I'm going to kill myself if I do family medicine. I can't do family medicine. I would rather suffer out, suffer out a one year prelim in surgery, which is always available in the soap because it is hard. It's a surgical internship. It's hard, long hours, more work than any of the other residencies, but I'd rather do that and give myself another shot at EM, right? So if you can get an internal medicine prelim, if you can get a surgical prelim, you've got that one year commitment, you get experience, a lot of mental development, you learn a lot of foundations that will help you later, and then you can try again. It's not a fun process, like Hillary said, but that's what that prelim is. So that's number two. And lastly is transition year. So that's what Dan was just mentioning. It is basically like being in medical school and doing a rotation in each thing. You do an OB, you do a family, you do a medicine. Um, I think you do like anesthesia at some places. I'm not sure if it's standard across the board, but that's what that is. And traditionally the transition years were for, for example, radiologists who are never going to touch patients again. And that would give them their clinical experience before they go sit behind a computer for the rest of their time. So that's what a transition year is. So as you're seeing these terms in your applications, because they will be in the regular match, I'm sure you've seen already, as well as in the SOAP, that's what the difference was, is, if you hadn't already known that. Okay, I sorry. Think, I think we should add in that there technically is one other option, um, is that you theoretically could decide not to SOAP and to take a gap year and do like a research um, fellowship, which is obtained outside of the SOAP um, or any kind of continuing education if you wanted to you know, get another degree or something. Um, I think that there's definitely pros and cons to that, but you don't have to SOAP that there is that to bring up as well. I was just also gonna mention uh, for some subspecialties like radiology, um, surgery prelim or internal prelim is a part of your, I call it the combo match. Basically, when you apply for categorical radiology, you also match into a prelim. Um, just as an FYI, it's you, you can still apply for it through the match initially. Um, and yes, there's, you know, always some positions available to soap into as well. Um, just something to think about um, as far as dual applying, if you're doing EM, if you're doing surgery, you could apply prelim along with that kind of as a plan B. And then that may show your initial interest in a prelim program versus waiting until soap and say just straight applying surgery only up front or straight applying EM only up front and then unfortunately not getting a spot. But if you had had those other prelim applications out there, in addition to your primary specialty, uh, specialty they may, you know, consider you more because you showed initial interest and applied 
earlier on. So just something to think about. I know dual applying is another topic. I didn't even know you could dual apply <laughs> until I was in a position to do my research and learn more about this, you know, pathway, if you will. So something else we can touch on if anyone has questions about. Um, another thing that's helpful is if you are applying to like a surgical prelim or a medicine prelim or transitional year, um, is applying to a place that has like an EM program or has the program that you're looking for because showing face is super important. And if you do a rotation down in their ER, um, you're able to obtain um, a slow, they can see you actually practicing as a doctor, not as a medical student. Um, and then if you're doing medicine and you go down and you're seeing their consults and just showing face and showing that you're a hard worker can, can be very helpful. And I think that when I was doing my transitional year at Inspira, that really actually um, helped me. They were able to write me a really, really, really great slow for um, my next application. And um, it just had a little different weight on it because I was already doctoring, not as like a med student. So I was seeing my own patients, writing my own notes, putting in my own orders um, and stuff like that. So um, I know sometimes you don't really get a pick of that, but if there is that opportunity to go to a place that has an EM program or whatever program you're, you're looking for, I, I highly recommend that if that's possible. I think we should back up for a second and um, go back to our discussion about categorical versus prelim versus transitional year. Because I think the one other point that a lot of students don't realize is that once you match into a categorical program, however long that program is, is essentially how much funding you have for residency. And so that's where problems happen is because say you end up switching from EM to IM and you match into an internal medicine program and it's a three-year program. And then your intern year, you decide that you really still wanna to go to EM, you work something out with your program where you're going to reapply. When you reapply to EM, you only have two years of funding left. And EM programs are a minimum of three. So that means that if a hospital is gonna rank you, the hospital has to fork the last year of the bill, not the government, which is typically who pays residency salaries. So it's a lot more complicated than that's like a watered down version, um, but that's a, something a lot of students don't realize. Um, and they don't realize that outside of just getting out of your contract and getting a new spot, there's a whole funding issue, which is a much bigger deal. Um, on this quick break, I'm gonna go ahead and there's a student, Nidia Saka, who wants to uh, talk. Nidia, can you, can you hear us or oh. can you speak? Yeah, there you go. Feel free to ask Hi, him. I don't know if you can see me. I'm sorry um, that I was a little bit late. Uh, the house next door got broken into, but I just wanted to say thanks for like doing this panel thing because uh, I have a lot of questions. So again, thank you for giving us your time, but I have a question in regards to um, ranking. Uh, so I'm just very confused. I'm not sure which of you guys, I don't know if you introduced yourself, went to the Caribbean for ECFMG certification. Do you guys, are you familiar with that? Yeah, that's me. Okay, so hi. Um, hi. <laughs> I just took CK because, uh, you know, due to the pandemic, I for Caribbean schools, we have to take the comp. And my right. sixth score was pushed back eight months. I just, PEDS just kept getting canceled. I was able to rank my list. Is I, uh, I was told that I wasn't going to be able to, but I was. I'm not sure if, like, it's going to go through. I don't know if, like, how the SOAP is gonna work for me because of the whole ECFMG certification and the rank list. Uh, so ECFMG is, should be fine. As long as you graduate, you get your ECFMG certificate and that should be before you start residency. So that shouldn't be an issue. Um, not really much that you need to think about in regards to ECFMG. They will, they'll manage it with your graduation diploma and all that. Um, in terms of SOAP and your rank list, if uh, I'm not sure exactly what happened, but as long as you were able to get your rank list in, um, yep. then there should be no reason that you couldn't participate in the SOAP should you end up okay. in that. And the SOAP, um, can you guys touch up? So on Monday, we're going to know if we matched or how does it work? I'm sorry, I was a little bit late today. Yeah, we didn't actually go through the details. So oh, okay. Monday you find out congrats, you matched or sorry, you didn't. Um, they are very good with their instructions. I will say that. So if you go to their website after this, 
They will have details about what time and when things open. And then they'll send you that stuff as well if you don't match to remind you. You, oh, perfect. They put it in the, Caitlin put it in the, the link there. So it has all the details. So they won't um, make you do anything that first day. Um, and you can't resubmit your, your list until usually I think it's Tuesday evening. Um, so you have a full day to compose yourself <laughs> and another almost full day to figure out your plan on how to deal with the soap. Um, from there, it's five more rounds of the algorithm, about almost two a day, basically. And you'll go through the match algorithm that many times. You get 45 applications. You don't have to pay for them. Okay. It's included in your original applications. Um, and so then the question becomes on your strategy, uh, which I'll let other people touch on, but this kind of two versions, either you put all 45 out at once or you like pick and choose and watch what fills up. Um, but maybe someone else wants to talk about that a little bit more. So um, any advice? A different for schedule this year. I do. So you will find out Monday whether or not you match you'll have access to start your SOAP application subsequently after that. But you, the programs can start seeing your application on Tuesday morning at 8 a.m. And then every, all four rounds of the match happen on Thursday. So they're all okay. going back to back. So I think that, I know we're gonna talk strategy here in a little bit, but I think that might change your strategy maybe a little bit because programs have a very minimal time in between each round. Um, so they're not going to have as much time to review new applications. So sorry to interrupt, but I just wanted to make sure we got out that information. I'm glad you mentioned that. That's definitely different. Wow. Um, can we apply to places that we didn't apply the first time? Okay. Yeah. And no pay. Great. Okay. Because the, all the places you applied the first time may have filled up. So <laughs> my baby's out the window. <laughs> so you, um, you may end up, uh, you know, there's just going to be all these programs that have PGY1 spots or categorical spots or totally different specialties. Again, you know, like Hillary um, and Caitlin were talking about, you got to really take that into consideration in your plan. But like Dan said, you have to have a backup plan in case you end up because you only get a day to really compose yourself and, and pull this together. So, and that's before on Thursday, the last day, the backup plan, like you? No, Monday will be the day you find out you didn't match. And so that's the day you need to like, okay, take a few minutes to take a breath, cry it out, do whatever you gotta do, then start pulling yourself together to make this plan um, for when it opens up again. Um, and then, yeah. It sounds like strategy wise with this new way that it's going is find the 45 programs that you want to apply to like, that day since they're going to be able to look at your application starting at 8 a.m the next day so it kind of seems a little bit more rushed in terms of trying to compose yourself than it has in the past but i would you know like you know cry it out and then start looking at that list and compose a list of 45 and have and have your list ready to go and application submitted before 8 a.m on on Tuesday sounds like probably the best strategy these days. So you're going to get a list when you find out you didn't match of what programs are open. So you'll be able to see all of your options. I think you probably have to use like at least 40 to 42 of those straight up in round one, because like we talked about, there's not going to be a lot of time to review applications in between. I don't know if maybe you hold a couple of spots just to make sure that some of those programs still have spots in round two, because it seems rare, but there could be a chance where you apply to 45 programs in round one and all 45 of those slots go, go, go away and then you wouldn't have any left. So I think maybe you save two or three, um, but I think like everybody said, you're going to have to apply to most of them. But the question becomes, if you're going to jump ship and change specialties, you probably are going to want to have another letter of recommendation and possibly even an updated personal statement or maybe just a couple paragraphs switched around um, because you're changing specialties. Um, and I know a lot of med schools, we keep all of our chairs of each department ready to go on Monday so that we can direct people, you know, to family medicine or internal medicine and they can write last minute letters. But if you truly think you might be in this scenario, 
and you really believe your backup plan is jumping ship to a different specialty, if you don't already have a letter from someone in that specialty, you might want to start, you know, thinking about who that would be and maybe even talking to them about a backup plan. So you don't end up having to do all of this in a, a scramble on Monday. I completely agree with everything you said, Caitlin. I was actually going to bring up, like, if you are going to switch specialties, like having like another personal statement ready and having somebody on the back burner for sure, just because um, they're still going to look for those, those types of things when they're quickly going through um, applications. Um, I don't know who in our attendees are like what years you guys are. So in case, so if you're already a fourth year and this is, you know, you're going into the soap, then you're just creating your backup plan now. If you're um, earlier than that, then I want to echo what um, Dr. Turner said, which is that you can dual apply. And if you get this stuff ready ahead of time, then when you end up in, if and when you end up in the soap, you'll be ready to go. So for example, I knew that I didn't want to do family medicine, despite what Ross told me. I was like, I can't, I just, I was about to sit down and write that personal statement. And I was like, I'm, I just cannot do this. So I was like, okay, prelims. So I started with the match looking for prelims. Um, and a lot of times they don't take right out of the match for people who aren't going into surgery because, you know, to have to spend the money and time to interview someone they're only going to know for a year, not always worth it. So I get it. Um, but I already had like a personal statement for that. I already, and I applied ahead of time. So I had a, a personal statement for that. I kind of had a letter for that just in case. So if you're not a PGY4 and this is something you're thinking about doing this dual application, um, that's a really good backup plan. And it's one that you can kind of prepare for ahead of time so that if you end up in the soap, you also already have it ready to go. Something else to consider too is say you do apply categorical surgery and you don't match. Um, and you know you want to apply to at least some prelims, but you're maybe kind of on the fence about another specialty, possibly maybe something completely different. You don't have to use all your 45 programs for prelim. You can apply 10 of this, 10 of that, if you really wanted to, not that I'm recommending that, but just so you, you can kind of formulate the best situation for you because I feel, and it's important to, to know too, that prelims during SOAP especially are that much more competitive because as someone, an applicant sitting there who doesn't match surgery, it is as an applicant sitting there who doesn't match EM, all these competitive specialties, all of those people are going to filter in and apply for prelims. So that's even more people putting their applications towards prelim and that just automatically makes it even more competitive. So if you're even thinking remotely, I want to do whatever secondary specialty, but I still feel like maybe I still have a shot at prelim or kind of whatever, you know, where, where you're sitting, what, what feels right. A lot of the time to you, you may decide to split applications and say, okay, well, I'm willing to put half towards prelim, half towards said other specialty. And for me, I, I, like I said, it was basically too late in the game after interviewing for internal medicine to apply surgery at all. So I had basically a month and that that's when I got my personal statement ready for surgery in order to attempt to soap into surgery. I got all my letters and uploaded them all to make sure they were there and I could send them directly to the, the programs that I decided to apply. And so I didn't successfully soap. So I, in March of last year, did not obtain a position and subsequently, you know, time marches on, right? You know, I graduated in May without a spot. And then there is for surgery, specifically a website, um, American College of Program Sur Surgeon Directors, um, open positions where program directors of surgery programs post vacant positions because surgery is one of the I don't know, the highest dropout rates, fortunate for me, <laughs> and some, you know, maybe for some of you guys too, that positions come open. So the prelim that was in the spot before me got accepted to categorical anesthesia and this spot that I currently am in opened July 13th of last year I applied you basically they say these are requirements on this website that I can put a link in into the chat for and you send an email with your diploma with your every you know documentation that they request via email to the coordinator and then I got accepted the next day and then I moved from Houston Texas to Chicago within two weeks and started a week after that so it really is there's there's lots of possibilities outside the soap it doesn't mean um outside the match or outside the soap that you're getting a non-ACG accredited position it doesn't mean you know that it's just there's a set 
formulation, so to speak, or set process that most people, you know, are able to get a position through the match. And then the secondary is the soap. But for people like myself, you know, and just to keep on the back burner for you guys, there are possibilities outside the match. I had no idea that that was even possible. I thought for sure, you know, I was setting up to do a research year. I thought I'm going to have to wait a full other year, you know, before residency is even on the table again. And sure enough, within a month of you know, everyone else starting, I was there. And then I got a categorical two spot and we're working out, you know, time of my vacation so that I don't have to graduate late. I can sit for my boards on time. So all that to say, there's a lot of options. <laughs> and Dr. Turner, while I have you, um, an anonymous attendee asked if we don't match in y'all's opinion was the best road to go if you, we won't accept anything except for EM, uh, similar to you saying that, you know, it's surgery or bust. Um, Dr. Sanchez and Dr. Bowers both said that Prelim year for sure is what you'd want. You get a one-year contract to gain experience and stay in the game, but you're free to try again next year. Um, prelim at a site with an EM program. Um, is there anything else you wanted to add for someone who's adamant about EM and nothing else? I think, I, I you know, best case scenario, you want to get a prelim. And I think that reason, you know, or that that's my opinion for several reasons. One being, what we talked about network networking opportunities, you know, you you're directly exposed with attendings, you're directly exposed with residents from other programs. And, you know, that is kind of a networking avenue that I, I didn't even know at the time that that resident from another program that I rotated with, he was my senior, spoke on my behalf and opened up a door for me that I'm, you know, eventually led to me getting a spot at at that program. So you never know. And I think prelim more so than anything is a networking opportunity. And it was kind of tough for me because I was starting um, later, right? And applications were also due because you're also having to reapply as a prelim because it's just a one year spot. You're getting letters of recommendation, things like that. It's really important if you do get a prelim that you get letters of recommendation from that program because people that are programs that you're applying to are going to want to see how you are. Uh, performing at said prelim program specifically. And so um, I was able to crank out two letters from, you know, the, the chair and the program director of this program. And I think that really helped. And I, I didn't really, you know, it, obviously now it seems important, but at the time I was like, oh my gosh, I have barely a month <laughs> to get two letters of recommendation in a, you know, a new state, a new environment, all this sort of thing, but it's completely possible. So prior, as I mentioned to to being set up to do a prelim, I was set to do research. Um, and that's also networking opportunity as well. If you want to go to an academic surgery program, you're really set on doing fellowship and, you know, that's something to consider as well. Um, just as far as networking opportunities and research more so can help you at academic programs than, um, than like community programs. For example, I wanna be a, a rural general surgeon. So I wanna work in the middle of nowhere. I wanna do most everything. And um, so research is less important for me, but it was only an alternative that I could, could figure out. And while you're doing research, these positions come open and you, you know, I had a reminder in my phone twice a day, check this website, check this website. And, you know, sure enough, I got a spot and then, you know, canceled the research plan and went with the prelim plan. I think it's important to realize how hard it is to rematch in the EM these days, though. Um, I, I hate to be like the, the bearer of bad news, but I just I want people to, you know, have a realistic expectation. Um, there's rarely any EM spots open, even for the soap. It's very rare. Um, and then to get a spot in the second year can be very tricky, um, especially if you don't end up at somewhere that has an EM program, because I think the, the most common thing I see is someone just matriculate on into that program. Um, it, it's tricky to even apply as an intern when you're doing a prelim year because you need a lot of time off. You need to do away rotations. You need to go to interviews. Um, and then nowadays, EM is just so competitive. Um, there was a survey actually done. Um, I forget if it's SAM or CORD that said two thirds of program directors would not rank someone that did a prelim year. Um, so your, your, your boat just got a lot, <laughs> your ocean got a lot smaller. Um, so it is possible if that's, you know, it's that or bust, that's your best shot, but it's probably going to be tricky. Um, so I just don't want to mislead you thinking that, you know, prelim year, you'll be back in the game with the same odds again. Yeah. I, oh, sorry. Uh, no, you go ahead. <laughs> I wanted to piggyback on what Caitlin was saying. I wanted to give you a little bit of an expectation 
for the soap. So the most common programs that you're going to see in the soap are number one, family medicine. The majority of programs that have openings are going to be family medicine. Um, surgery doesn't usually have too many, but surgical prelims, like I said, are usually abundant. Um, medicine prelims are few. Uh, transition years are few and um, EM spots are very few. So that's something to give you uh, expectations wise. The other thing I wanted to let you know, cause we hadn't explicitly said it is that from Tuesday when they open um, and you can, they can start seeing your applications till Thursday, the match, you should be prepared that whole time. You should like not leave your house and be prepared to do interviews because they may be Zooming with you and doing interviews at that time. Uh, I literally would wake up because I'm Pacific time. So I'd wake up at like six in the morning in case they're, you know, on the other side of the coast. And I'd sit there with my suit jacket hanging on a door ready to go and my makeup done. And I wouldn't leave in front of the TV. My husband was like, you're so stressed, go work out. I was like, I can't, then I'll get sweaty. And if they want to call me, I won't be ready. So like, you just sit there all day just in case. And maybe that doesn't sound healthy, but I mean, I don't know, you know, they may call you and you don't want to mess up that opportunity. So um, that was the second part of the expectations that I wanted to set there. Yeah. I think you brought up a really good point though. We didn't also explicitly say this, but when each round of the soap ends, you have two hours to accept or reject any offers you get. You could get three offers. You could get one, you could get zero. So if there's a person in your life, your spouse, your family, whoever it is, that you want to make this decision with, then that Thursday, you better make sure they're available um, because you don't have a lot of time to make a decision and you don't want to be like trying to, you know, get your husband out of a meeting or calling somebody. So make sure that someone's available if you want to be with someone during this process. And also to like piggyback off of, you know, how competitive EM is getting. The first time I applied, I had many more interviews than the second time I applied. The second time I applied, I had six interviews. I only had six interviews. Um, and well, I told myself I was only going to take 10 interviews total. I, I applied EM and IM because my backup was IM palm crit. That was going to be my backup. So, um, as like things happen, there's more IM spots than there are EM spots. So you start to get IM interviews a lot sooner than you do EM interviews. EM interviews tend to come later. So as it happened, I was canceling IM interviews, but I would only interviewed at like six EM programs. And I actually interviewed at Drexel like the last day of January. And then that's like where I ended up matching. Um, but I, but in order to do that during like a, my, my transitional year, how it worked was I basically told every single attending that I was working with that day, like that month, the start a new month, like, look, I'm interviewing for this X, Y, and Z. I worked every single holiday because every holiday we got, we got an extra day off. So that year I worked literally every holiday for 365 days. And we did a 12 on two off schedule. And I switched things around to get to interviews where I'd be working like 21 days straight. So that way I could make an interview. So yeah, it's an incredibly hard road. And yes, I had less interviews and I don't know if I got lucky. I don't know, but, um, but you have to definitely like work your ass off. If this is like what you really want, you really do. It's not something like, oh, I'll get a prelim and I'll automatically, you know, match into EM next year. I mean, I was still worried I wasn't going to match EM the day on Monday when I found out I had matched somewhere because it easily could have been IM and not EM. You want to be well connected too. If you end up in a position where you feel like you're going to do a prelim year and then you're going to reapply to EM, you want to be at conferences. You want to know people. Um, you really want to put yourself out there because that that's your last shot and it's going to be an uphill battle, but I mean, it does happen for some people. So it's doable. It's just not going to be easy. I went to ASAP and I went to the residency fair and I prop and I took like a business card with my name, where I was, email, and I think I probably got three interviews from that. Three, half of my interviews were from that, one of them being Drexel. So um, just keep that in mind that, yeah, if you're doing a prelim year and you need time off, look for when ASAP is specific. I literally like drove from New Jersey to DC for the day of the residency fair and drove back because I had to be at work the next morning at like 5 a.m. 
So. I second that networking is huge. You have to put yourself out there. You have to be proactive. You have to be willing to say, you know, just work hard, let people see that because I know, you know, I'm not as familiar with EM, obviously I'm familiar with surgery. So thinking, you know, statistics wise going into a prelim, I knew <laughs> that the, I think the last dropout rate I saw was like in the 25 average percentile of surgery. So I thought if this is something that I want to do, at least there's a chance. And no matter what you decide to do, whether you do EM surgery, family, there's always a chance. And I'm a big proponent of, if you want to do something, you put your mind and your heart into it. You work hard, you network, you be proactive. You work 21 days in a row. You know, I, I didn't get any vacation my first year at all. Granted, I did start late, but I also, after graduating, I had never taken step two, right? Cause I'm a DO. I thought I wanted to do primary care. I studied, I took step two. I got into this program, you know, the week, the following I was moving the following weekend. So I didn't even have a week to say by my family and things and you just move. And, you know, I've been home maybe twice since then. So it's, it's a whirlwind, but it, I think it's a hundred percent worth it. And to the point of having your support system there too, I remember on match day, you know, I kind of knew it was coming for me given my situation, but I just handed my computer to my husband and I said, read this because I can't even read it right now. Just tell me what I need to do so that we can get a game plan together. And, um, yeah, all those convoluted thoughts together. I just, I, I know how it feels to be in a situation to where you kind of maybe anticipating something happen, or hopefully you're on the other end of the spectrum where you're just kind of trying to learn about the process in case you do end up there. Um, but yeah. We have a question, um, I think a clarification, a fourth year student done now, uh, grades have been released, and wondering if in the SOAP process they have to show their elective grades. So I know that when we submitted an ERAS back in September, it was just our transcript up to till then. Do we need to update anyone if we're part of this SOAP process? I think his question, his or her question is actually, um, how can they update their application so it reflects their electives that they didn't get in there before? But I don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> I think that's going to have to come up in an interview because my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong for the people who have SOAP, is you can change your personal statement and you can upload new letters, but you can't touch the rest of your application. So I think any sort of additional information like that would have to be once a program's reached out to you, you could maybe give them an unofficial transcript or just verbally tell them. But there's no way to up, like the medical schools don't up upload new stuff. So I don't think there's any other way from my knowledge point. I think you might yeah, be able to ask your school to do it. And normally we don't do that or think about that because the application's out there and they're not going to, nobody's going to be looking at it again, but uh, it might be worth asking your school if they can upload a new one. But if you're also in good standing too, and you're a fourth year, it's the expectation, you know, that you're going to graduate. I'm not sure if that's your concern or if you had another reason for wanting to upload those grades, but I think it's assumed, you know, you'll graduate and have all the credits you need. Yeah. Another thing to think about too, um, if let's say you guys end up doing a prelim year and are applying again, I took step three also like really early to use it as like leverage, like, hey, look, I'm interviewing. I took step three, I already passed it. Um, that's just something else to think about that if you're doing a prelim year, take, take step three early. Yeah, and take it very seriously, because if you yes. really knock step three out of the park, it can be huge in your uh, chances of getting what you want, which I think was a big part of how I was able to get into EM. Same here. 12 family medicine interviews and one EM interview. <laughs> but I was, I mean, I was doing a lot of research with family medicine, trying to figure out like urgent care, maybe trying to be the person who introduces ultrasound into family medicine. So there's you know, you got to have a lot of ways to take what you thought your dream was and then bring it into some reality of a new dream for yourself and what the possibilities can be that are actually available. And so don't, don't feel like you have to like let go or like that you're, you have this crushing loss, but rather you're being redirected in a different direction by fate or whatever powers that be. So just kind of emotionally, that might be a good way to frame things. 
I'd be interested to hear from some of you about, I, I noticed that a lot of times students, they put a lot of time and thought into like reapply, doing their 45 position, 45 slots and updating their application and things. But I see that people at that point, they just kind of stop. And I think you probably want to do a little bit of interview prep um, because now you're going in into an interview with someone knowing that you didn't match and that there had to have been some red flag somewhere or whatever it may be. So do, can anyone talk about like what those interviews are like or what kind of things they asked you? Because they're not really the typical interview. They're very rushed, I'm assuming. I took the approach of really leaning into my problems where I had a step two problem. And then I had like a, you know, a couple of bad evaluations during my fourth year where I leaned into those things and said, I realized that this was a bad issue. I realized that I had these problems now and I did this, 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 and this to fix it. So mine was just like a phone call interview. It was um, it was pretty informal, actually. I was actually surprised at how quickly this interview went just to get like this transitional year spot. Um, but mainly they just asked me, you know, specifically for prelim, like you're doing this prelim. Why are you doing it? What are your goals at the end? Um, and making sure they align. And then I agree with Dan, like just being very open and honest with like, okay, this is, you know, this is my red flag. This is why I don't believe I matched. Here's what I'm going to do to fix it. And I want to come to your program in hopes to become, you know, like a better, you know, physician in order to like help, like, like, you know, shed some light that I am like more of a good physician over like my, my red flag of whatever, of whatever it may be. But I always think that it is pretty important to like own up to why you, why you truly believe that you did not match and what you know can come off as like a red flag. I'm gonna interject really quickly. We have about seven minutes left. So attendees, if you have any last minute burning questions, feel free to throw them in the Q&A in the chat box or uh, raise your hand and I'll um, permit you to speak so you can ask our panelists. Um, just a quick summary for those people who end up seeing this recording later on. Uh, Margaret Ellen had asked, how long should our personal statement be? Um, and if there's a website to see if there's new EM programs that might have programs outside the match. Um, and Dr. Davenport had said that a personal statement should be no longer than a page and SAEM website has a list of open spots, she believes. And um, someone asked how, what is early for step three? Uh, Dr. Sanchez had said early in the prelim year. Um, so I'm assuming. I took yeah. mine in, no, I took mine like the first week of November, like October, November was when I took it. So that way I had my, I had my scores back before, um, cause so EM tends to interview F like, oh gosh, like mid September through like January. So I wanted to make sure that my step three score was available at least for some or most of my EM interviews. And then, um, at least Sorry, I'll I'll EM interviews tend are currently being held usually a little bit later now. Um, and most programs agree to not start before October, or actually, I think they don't even open them till like October, something like that. So October so the, 15th is the first day they even got applications this yeah. year. So, so the, it's kind of like an agreement between EM programs to hopefully take off the stress and be um, you know, equal. So the interviews for EM now are, have pushed to later. Dr. Turner gave us two more websites, Residency Swap and Med Residency, which also lists spots outside the match. And then um, Elisa, Eliza um, asked, uh, what is the, the best things to include in a prelim surgery personal statement? I don't know about the best things, but for me, I, I basically used my EM statement. And then at the end, I changed the final paragraph to say why I felt a surgical prelim would be a benefit to me. Um, that was my theory. I don't know what Hillary or Dan or. Um, yeah, basically talk about, you know, why you're doing this prelim. Like what is your goals post prelim? Like if you're doing a medicine residency, I, or if you're doing an EM residency and you're trying to get into a medicine prelim, like I want to learn 
like your last paragraph should be like, I want to do medicine because, you know, I think it'll help me in X, Y, and Z to get me to, to my goal. Um, I don't ever think that you should just say like, yeah, like after this, I want to go into IM if you have no intentions of doing that. Definitely, you know, as you're, when you're there, you may change your mind and you may be on the floor and you're like, wow, like I really do like IM. But I think for these interviews specifically, like they, they know you didn't match. Why, why didn't you match? Because you wanted to go on something that's getting more competitive, like EM and, um, and just be like very honest with them. Cause you can always change your mind once you get there. But I think a lot of the interviews, like they just want honesty and why you want to come to like that specific program. Always err on the side of honesty. And like I said, leaning into your issues and what you've done to solve them. All right, we're in our final three minutes. Um, in case, unless there's a last minute question uh, thrown in, panelists, if you can give us maybe like a 30 second, one minute uh, takeaway from the session, just something that you want our attendees to know. And we'll start off with Dr. Mersh. It'll be okay. <laughs> it's hard. It sucks. But you'll be okay. Um, I would say, obviously, what Dan said, it will be okay. But just because you don't match or just because you know, you, your, your life path isn't going in the exact direction that you want it to. I mean, my hospital closed, like I, I didn't match, finally matched my hospital closed. I picked up my shit. I moved it in two weeks to a city that I didn't know anybody and I had no apartment and you know what? And I still have my dream job. I'm still going to be on faculty at Ohio state as like in the ultrasound division. So just because, you know, there's a lot of road bumps, hospital closures, you will get to where you want and you will graduate. And at the end of the day, you, you're still going to be a badass doctor. So just remember like all the hard work that you, that you did. It's, it is worth it in the end. Sometimes there's just lots of shades of gray in front of you, but it will be okay. For all those IMGs that I saw in the and the participants, exactly what Hillary said. We have roadblocks. I know the DOs do too, which is why, you know, my program was ZO. I know a lot of DOs. It's hard. We've got a lot of biases. So I, I definitely appreciate what you said there, Hillary. You'll get to the end and it won't matter that you went to Ross or to wherever. Um, but my takeaway has always been twofold. Number one, prelims, don't forget about them. And two, have a backup plan. I don't care what your backup plan is. Think about it long and hard, make sure you're happy with it, but have a backup plan. I'll jump off of that. I would say try to think about your backup plan before you get into the moment of Monday um, because a lot of emotions are going around it. And don't forget to lean on your support system. And that includes any advisors you may have because there's people that have been there or have helped people in the past who can really help you. And it takes some of the stress off of you and the craziness that is the soap week. And my takeaway is I am a big proponent of pursuing your passion with purpose. And um, I didn't always listen to my advisors. I, did, I personally didn't have a backup plan once I knew what I wanted to do. And so um, not to by any means not have a backup plan in general. Like I think, you know, mine was maybe research if I had to pick, but I knew ultimately what I was going to do. I just wasn't quite sure how to get there. So there's nothing wrong with that mentality at all, mentality at all. And I think that if you want to do something, um, I encourage you to do it because a lot of the time, you know, we question ourselves. Other people are kind of giving us advice. I was encouraged to apply family medicine. People always kind of maybe suggest things that you don't really want to hear, but ultimately it's what you decide you want to do. And as long as you're comfortable with that and my cats are running around in the background, so I apologize, um, do what you want to do and, you know, Please join me in thanking Drs. Davenport, Sanchez, Jenkins Turner, Bowers, and Mersh for sharing with us tonight. We really appreciate it. They are on Twitter and Instagram, so feel free to follow them and uh, reach out if you have any other questions or if they want to throw something in the chat box with contact information, they can definitely do so. We are always interested in your feedback. So as you lead the webinar tonight, please take a moment to answer a few short questions. And please join us for our next uh, Women in EM session on April 5th demystifying VSAS. I know we've got fourth year's year. 
feel free to tell your third year classmates, colleagues, and to register for this and other upcoming sessions, please visit the AEM Women in EM website and select the appropriate links. Thank you for joining us again tonight. We look forward to seeing you again soon. This now ends tonight's program. Good night.